Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our study through the whole deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are calling these conversations Talks with Walt. And we turn now to the Calamus section in pot and pads untrodden, um, the very first poem of the, uh, some 39 poems of, of the Calamus section. Oh, and notice just even in the line itself, in pads untrodden, we immediately are going to think about frosts, the road not taken. We've given full lectures of this elsewhere at LearnStrong.net. Speaking of LearnStrong.net, our assumptions are that you have been following our stuff all the way from the very beginning of our study at LearnStrong.net, down the left-hand side, find that Talks with Walt uh, playlist. And uh, for sure, my assumption is that you have watched our introductory set of comments to Calamus. If you haven't done that, you'll see it in the description box. You'll want to watch that lecture to be able to get you ready to study this lecture. Now, let's talk really quickly about background information. And as we always do, we're going to go uh, to our uh, Nortons. And we're going to hear there about just a few pieces of information regarding untrodden. In all editions now reading from Norton's, this resolute announcement opens the Calamus group, taking its present title in 1867, although in the revisions of his 1860 copy, Whitman had considered the alternate title by the Calamus pun, I wonder, which is fascinating given our study of Thoreau, right? Three different uh, manuscripts offer variant readings, including these lines, quote, and now I care not to walk the earth unless a friend walk by my side. And now I dare sing no other songs, only those of lovers. Um, with that in mind, this is a, one of the great poems, right, of comradeship. So let's go ahead and turn to it now. And as we do so, let's go ahead and put it in our notes, what we will say again at 3A here in a few moments. Whitman was convinced, and I think rightfully so, that America needed an epic. Of course, we have the Homeric epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Roman epic of the Aeneid. We, of course, will have our Dante in the Divine Comedy. We have our Milton in Paradise Lost. We've given full lectures explicating every one of the books of all of those majestic poems at LearnStrong.net. But I think from Whitman, he heard the call from Emerson and said, we need an American epic. What will that American epic be? And I think Whitman gave two answers. His first answer blows away us still. The American answer to where is your national epic for Whitman is, I hear America singing. That is to say, we don't have an epic. We are an epic. It's an amazing idea. But I think the second way that Whitman decided to answer that question was obviously Leaves of Grass. So when he comes to a, a, a poem like In Paths Untrodden, I think so much is already sitting behind his understanding of what makes great epics. For example, journeys. And of course here we're going to take a journey on a path that is untrodden, right? And immediately we think about Dante, of course, and Dante the Pilgrim with Virgil's help being led through, for example, Inferno. Let's read the poem. In Paths Untrodden, in the growth by margins of pond waters, escape from the life that exhibits itself from all the standards hitherto published, from the pleasures, profits, conformities, which I too long, which too long I was offering to feed my soul. Clear to me now, standards not yet published, clear to me that my soul, that the soul of the man I speak for, rejoices in comrades. Here, by myself, away from the clank of the world, tallying and talked to here by tongues aroma. No longer abashed, for in this secluded space I can respond as I would, not dare elsewhere. Strong upon me the life that does not exhibit itself, yet contains all the rest. Resolved to sing no songs today, but those of manly attachment, projecting them along the substantial life, bequeathing hence types of athletic love. Afternoon, this delicious ninth month in my 41st year, I proceed with all who are or have been young men to tell the secret my nights and days, to celebrate the need of comrades. Now notice, we'll begin with the idea of paths, right? And we immediately, for example, think of um, passage 24 of Song of Myself. Let's just think about that for a moment in terms of lines that we heard before, right, as we were uh, as we were messing around. He says it, divine am I inside and I and out, and uh, make holy whatever I touch or am I touched from, the scent of these armpits, aroma finer than prayer, this head 
more than churches, Bibles, all creeds. Oh, remember broad, muscular fields, branches of live oak, loving lounger in my winding paths, it shall be you. You'll remember these lines, we already have explicated them. Of course, the idea of being untrodden, right? We will see this word one more time in Song of the Broad Acts, number 8, the scaffold that is untrodden. Of course, Whitman was a great walker, just like we've said of Thoreau, right? In the growth by margins, only time used in all of Leaves of Grass. Isn't that fascinating? But think about the ways in which the word margin and living among the margins and the peripheral has been so much about what Whitman's uh, project has been about. Of pond waters, escaped from the life that exhibits itself. It's a fascinating word, this idea of escaping, right? From all the standards, we're going to come back to this word standards in a little bit, hitherto published from the pleasures, profit, conformities. We think about Emerson's self-reliance, don't we, right? Um, and, and think about this idea of the standards, right? From Song of Myself, Passage 1. You'll remember creeds and schools and abeyance. In other words, Whitman is acutely aware that what he's doing in a poem, a set of poems like Calamus, is he's breaking the mold. He's doing something quite different from any poet that's come before, right? He says, which too long I was offering to feed my soul. Do you remember this idea of too long from passage 46, long enough, have you dreamed contemptible dreams? I love this line of feed my soul. This is the only time it's used this way in all of Leaves of Grass. And it is a great 3D question, so write it down. How do you feed your soul? I think one good answer is, of course, our study together of Walt Whitman's Lisa of, Gat, of Grass. And then he says it, clear to me now. He loves this word now. Go back and just study the way he's already used it in Leaves of Grass. Clear to me now, standards not yet published. Notice it is the highlighted verb, right? Uh, as we said, to try and capture that American speech pattern. Clear to me now, standards not yet published, and then he repeats it. Clear to me that my soul, that the soul of the man I speak for, rejoices in comrades. Now this will be the last word of the poem. Comrades for Whitman, we've seen this uh, word before elsewhere in Leaves of Grass. Such an important use of the word. Friendship, pal. I love the word pal, so we'll use that word. Here, that immediacy of the poems of Leaves of Grass often is registered with this word here. Here, by myself, away from the clank of the world. Go back to Lisa Grass and notice how he likes to use the word clank. It's a fascinating use of the word clank of the world. We have to think about our Wordsworths and Ten Turn Abbey. He'll talk, of course, about the din that he has had to deal with in the city, the clank of the world. And then he uses the word tallying and talked to. Now this is, of course, going to make us immediately think of Song of Myself, passage 20, uh, 25. We were at 24 a few minutes ago. Let's go ahead and turn to that one in just for a second. Do you remember this set of lines as we were playing, um, as we were playing that game in passage Song of Myself, passage uh, 25? Do you remember this? Where he'll play around with, Now I will do nothing but listen to accrue what I hear into this song to let sounds contribute to it. Think about that clank of the world. I hear bravas of birds, brussel of growing wheat, gossip of flames, clank of sticks. There is that, there is that word, right, as, as we're playing around with it. This idea then of tallying will be central to the way that we will read this as we go forward, right? And, and, he'll, and he'll play the game even at the end. He'll play around with the idea, I am cut by bitter and angry hail. I lose my breath, steeped amid honeyed morphine. I'll let you go back and look at our whole explication of that with the tallying and talk to here by tongues aromatic. In other words, he says, I'm going to enjoy the language that I want to enjoy, the music that I want to enjoy. No longer abashed, this idea of being abashed. It's its only use in Leaves of Grass of being ashamed. We've seen this before. For Notice the parenthetic that makes us think of our Emily Dickinson. For in this secluded spot, right, um, this will take us to Lilac's Last in the Door, Our Bloom, Passage 4, and the swamp that is also a secluded spot. I can respond as I would not Dare elsewhere. Only two times will find, or I mean, uh, think about it, dare used two times in our Children of Adam poems as we saw them. Strong upon me, he says, the life that does not exhibit itself, yet contains, this is that inclusivity piece, all the rest. And then he says, a result to sing no songs today. And again, it's important to remind ourselves of the influence that Whitman 
will give to us of music, and he will be influenced by music here, especially choral music. He loved the opera, right? Uh, um, look at it again. Upon me strong the life that does not exhibit itself contains all the rest. Resolve to sing no songs today, but those of manly attachment. Now, this is that adhesiveness that he learned from his study of phrenology when we have men and men together, as opposed to amativus, which we saw in our study of children of Adam, between male and female, right? Projecting, it's an interesting, notice all the ing words here, projecting, bequeathing, projecting them along that substantial life. What is the real thing? What Thoreau will call the essentials, right? I went to the woods because I wish to live, right? And to, and to understand that, he says deliberately, that's his word. And to confront only the essential facts, he'll say it that way, right? Here it is, substantial life. Bequeathing hence types of athletic love. Earlier it was manly attachment, now it's an athletic love. And then he will date this poem to September of 1859, and he will tell us he's 41 years old, so this will take us back, obviously, to Song of Myself, Passage 1. This at, and He'll say it, afternoon this Delicious. He loves this word, delicious. You'll remember from I Sing the Body Electric, Passage 5, right? Swelling and deliciously aching was the way he used the word there. This ninth month in my 41st year, again, September 1859, I proceed. This is, of course, the first poem of the Calamus section. For all, it's that inclusivity again, who are or have been young men, to tell the, to tell the secret my nights and days this idea of secrets and what I'm going to share. Now, two observations here really quickly. Notice he's calls to young men, but obviously you don't have to be a young man to read and love these poems. And secondly, I would say, he mentions secrets, and there's a whole lot of people that love to read in between the lines of Whitman's Leaves of Grass, trying to figure out what the secret is. I follow here the great Bloom, who is a great commentator of Whitman, who will point out that while Whitman promises again and again and again, to be honest, to be able to disclose his secrets, we get, we get way more ambiguity, we get way more enigma than we ever seem to get full disclosure. It's the genius, of course, of the poet to be able to do that. And then finally, the celebration line. To celebrate, right? And this is what has been so much our study. You cannot help but enjoy reading Whitman aloud and somehow feeling like every third line should end with an exclamation point, right? It is, it is about the celebration. And he's going to call it the celebration of the need for comrades. And of course, again, this word comrades is a central, central word. It's all about pals. Let's finish at 2A. And it really is about pals. Life is really made more full by our pals and those that we consider our comrades. At 2B, of course, the echoes are amazing here, so I'm pointing those out to you at 3A. I've mentioned our Homer and the Homeric tradition of the singer through Virgil and Dante to Milton and then finally to Emerson. I also would suggest that we could put there, obviously, Emily Dickinson and then the name that I began with, right, in Frost. Um, uh, I chose the, the, the path less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. We, we've given full explication of that at LearnStrong.net as well. Finally, in 3B, so many ways to think about this, right? How do you feed your soul is a great question. What is your secluded spot? What is that spot where you are that you feel safe? You feel in some ways truly protected? And what are the ways in which that spot produces for you certain kinds of artistic enterprises? I hope, now that we are into the Calamus section, that you will enjoy this study as we move now through all of these poems. Thank you.